here this morning. Thank you, Steve. What a, what a blessing. What a blessing and much uh, great theology in those, uh, in those verses that we just got through singing, too. Uh, that, was, that was fantastic. Well, praise God. This morning, uh, we have much to rejoice about. The subject this morning is the love of God. Uh, as we explore the attributes of God, let us pray and ask God's blessing on this message this morning, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for today. We thank you that we can come into your presence and sing and understand, Lord, uh, the grace of God, the love of God. Uh, may we truly, Lord, uh, be motivated by your tremendous love for us. Again, we thank you and praise you for the gift of the Savior, Jesus Christ, who came and died that we might live, how we rejoice together in him. And we pray this all now in Jesus' wonderful name, for his glory, amen. Well, I love to make milkshakes. <laughs> Can I just tell you that? I, I love to make milkshakes, and my favorite milkshake is a blueberry milkshake. And I always start off with vanilla ice cream. I mean good vanilla ice cream and so tasty and so good. And I begin by scooping the ice cream out and throwing it into my blender. And after I put that in there, I usually get the blueberries out. And uh, my wife and I, we, we like to go and pick our own blueberries. And the place that where we go, they have a, a saying, it's uh, two in your mouth and one in the bucket. They are so tasty. You just sit there and eat and eat and eat while you're picking. It is just phenomenal stuff. You just love it, love it, love it. Well, these are the blueberries that I take, these big blueberries. And my wife and I always have a competition. She finds the biggest and best ones. I go find the tree. That's, that's my strategy. I find the tree. And I, if I get a really good bush, I'll pick it clean because... Not all bushes taste the same. So anyway, that's a little side note. But I put those wonderful blueberries into the blender. And uh, then I get the, the nice milk and, and, and I pour the milk in there. Well, it doesn't stop there. Because the next ingredient is very important as well. And that's the vanilla syrup. Uh, when I was a kid in high school, I decided that it was worth it to go to Friendly Ice Cream to work there for a little while. So that I could find out how they made their good milkshakes. And I discovered this vanilla syrup is really the key. If you make milkshakes at home and they never taste like the restaurant types, it's because you're lacking the vanilla syrup. Not vanilla extract, that's horrible. Vanilla syrup. <laughs> vanilla syrup is what you want, I'm just telling you. Well, you put all of these ingredients together and you push liquefy, and the next thing you know, all of these things start whipping around and you've got this blueberry milkshake. And I mean, it's to die for. It is so good. It is absolutely delicious. I was watching the grandkids one day when they were here back several months ago. And the one wasn't one year old yet. But you know, you got you to gotta grow up sometime, right? <laughs> and, and so I put a glass, of, uh, just a, a plastic cup. And there was no lid on it or anything. And uh, I, I set him there in the chair at the counter, and I gave him his first blueberry milkshake. And he looked at me, and, and I, I, I held it up to his mouth, and he took it out of my hands, and he just guzzled the whole thing. <laughs> and he put it down, and he looked up at me, and he had this beautiful blue you know, mustache. It was just amazing. You know, every one of those ingredients in that milkshake, uh, except for the syrup, I wouldn't want to really drink that too much by itself, but all of the things are quality. You know, the milk is good quality, and, and you got to have milk if you have chocolate chip cookies, you know what I'm saying? And so milk is good, and the ice cream. The vanilla ice cream, it, that stands alone, and it's good too, isn't it? And all those blueberries, just eating them just like they're candy while you're picking those blueberries. They are delicious as well. But there's something about it when they all come together, and they produce something very, very special. And that's what cooking is all about, isn't it? Well, when you think of the attributes of God, every single one of the attributes of God stands alone and is absolutely excellent. Whether we're talking about the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the power of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the, you name it, the love of God, all of those things are so amazing in and of themselves. When you put them all together, it is the essence of who God is. 
And this morning, we're going to study the importance of the love of God today because the love of God uh, is something that we all believe in and is a very important attribute of God. But it just doesn't stand alone. It comes together with the other attributes of God. And it is so important that we stop to give it some very important attention. Last time we were talking, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the righteousness of God. And we talked about the holiness of God before that. And truly God is holy and truly God is righteous. And then we followed up with another attribute of God and that is the wrath of God. And we talked about God's wrath as a response. Every time man sins, there's a response from God, and we see that in the wrath of God. And so the wrath of God is very, very real. If God were not holy, if God were not just, there would be no reason for the wrath of God. But because he is holy, and because he is just, we have the wrath of God. We've looked at people like Moses and Abraham in the Old Testament who interceded on the behalf of sinners and they came between the wrath of God and the judgment of God. When we come to the New Testament, we find that we are all under the wrath of God. In fact, we've all been under the wrath of God since we've descended from Adam. And you are under the wrath of God this morning as I was under the wrath of God even before my birth. It has nothing to do with what I've done. It is the fact that I have a sin nature. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. And so what I need and what you need is some type of intercession, some type of, it, of an intervention as, as Abraham pleaded for the people that God was about to destroy. As Moses came before God and said, don't destroy the Israelites. How is this going to look on a number of occasions? You and I find ourselves needing that intercession we need an intervention, and that happens in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes, he hangs on the cross, he takes upon himself the sins of the whole world. Now ask yourself this major question, why? Why would you do that? Why would you do that, Lord? Why would you send your only begotten son? And the reason for that is the love of God. You and I need to study the love of God because the love of God is widely accepted, but it's oftentimes misunderstood. We tend to believe in a God of love who operates according to our own definition. We've redefined what that love is supposed to look like. And so we have taken out of the equation the wrath of God or the judgment of God. In fact, most people today would say, yes, I believe that God is a loving God, and I believe that at the end of my life, I will throw myself at the mercy of God, and because he's loving, he'll let me into heaven. And that's oftentimes the way people in the world today think. And so we would have commonality with them in the sense that I would say, yes, I agree that God is loving. But I also don't agree with the idea that God's wrath and judgment can be pushed aside. Because the holiness of God still is in place. When you go back through the Old Testament, uh, you see the loving kindness of God. That Hebrew word has said is over and over repeated in, for instance, a psalm like Psalm 136. Psalm 136 repeats the word loving kindness so many times I can't even count them all. It starts off there in verse 1 where it says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. You know that verse? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. This is what it says after that. For his loving kindness is everlasting. And the next statement says, give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for his loving kindness is, right, so you get the picture. And he goes through all that entire psalm to the very end, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And in Psalm 136, there's the creation and uh, deliverance from Egypt. All of those things point to the loving kindness of God. And so we see this prevalent theme throughout the scriptures. The love of God is really the cause and it's the basis for the standard of all love. 
just like the holiness of God is the standard for all holiness. The righteousness of God is the standard for all righteousness. The love of God is the standard for all love. In fact, you and I would not even understand nor know the significance of love were it not demonstrated to us by Almighty God. Hence, when we come to the New Testament, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is, the first one is love. Exactly. It is that basis. It's the standard for all love. The Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament. When they come to Jesus and they ask him, you know, so, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then he goes on and he says, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Amazingly, the Old Testament has at its root here love. And so love is so prevalent, it's worth studying, isn't it? The Apostle Paul would say this in 2 Corinthians 5.14. He says, the love of Christ, I think the King James says, constrains me. Uh, New American Standard says, controls me. The love of Christ controls me. Well, what exactly does that mean? I know it means something important. And so again, it's worthwhile studying this subject of love. Love is very prominent in the New Testament as well as we see from 2 Corinthians, but also Ephesians chapter 5, where it talks about our love for one another, and it talks, for instance, about husbands. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Permeating the New Testament is this subject of love as well. So it's vital. It's very, very much intertwined with everything. And so it's very important as well as a Christian brother that I love my Christian brethren. And that permeates the scriptures as well. You go to 1 John, and John has much to say about it. So this morning, we're going to go through several characteristics of love, and when we come to the last characteristic, we're going to take two New Testament passages and kind of pull those things apart so we understand the magnitude of the love of God. The first characteristic that I want to talk about this morning, just, and I'll just hit on these briefly, is that God's love is infinite. It's unlimited. It is unfathomable. Psalm 103 in verse 11 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. That's Psalm 103, 11. Isn't that a great song? Let me read it again. For as high as the heavens are above the earth. That's pretty far, right? You agree? Heavens are pretty far above. So great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. Isaiah chapter 63 Verse 7, Isaiah is writing, and he says, I shall make mention of the loving kindness of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has granted them according to his compassion and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. There is absolutely no question that God loves the people of Israel, that he has got plans for them that he is going to fulfill all the promises that were made to his people. In the New Testament, God's word says, so that Christ, this is um, Ephesians chapter 3, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend what this love means, a love that extends to the saints. Second thing is that God's love is eternal never stops. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, Psalm 136. It is going to endure forever. It never stops. Also, God's love is immutable. Don't you love the word immutable? That's one of my favorite words. I just love the word immutable. Immutable means this. It means that things don't change. God is unchanging. How often Love can change. Have you ever noticed that? You can fall in and out of love with someone, can't you? You can love them at one hour of the day and not love them another. It just seems like love is very wishy-washy. My wife and I discovered a a pizza restaurant that we liked. We started to go there. We went there almost every week. It was really cheap, and we loved it. And we went there, and we went there, and we went there. And one day, Karen says to me, 
oh, I don't want to go. She says, I'm so sick of that. <laughs> and I said, are you really? I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> and, and, and so after two more times, I looked at her and I said, you know what? I'm sick of this. And we haven't been back since. Now, I used to love it. And you and I fall in and out of love with a lot of different things in life, don't we? Here's the neat thing about our God. God's love never, ever changes. It's immutable. God's love is going to be sustained through the ages. As God grabs Abram out of the Ur of the Chaldees and he makes for himself a nation, a people who would serve him and they were disobedient, God never stops loving Israel. Isn't that amazing? He never gives up on them. And there will be a spiritual restoration. The people of Israel will be back in their land during that millennial kingdom. How wonderful it is that God never, ever withdraws his love. Song of Solomon says this, and Song of Solomon's a great book, especially if you want to read and, and, and apply it in a sense that it really speaks about God's love for his people. But Solomon writes, he says, put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as severe as Sheol. It flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. This is speaking of the great love that God has for his people. Nothing is going to remove it. It is going to be sustained forever. James 1.17 says, every good thing bestowed in every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no turning. There's no variation. There's no shifting shadow. God's love is immutable. Another aspect or characteristic of love is that God's love is also holy. When we talked about holiness, I mentioned that holiness permeated all of the other attributes so that the righteousness of God was holy. Uh, the power of God is holy. The goodness of God is holy. Even the love of God is holy. It is a holy love that God loves us with. And we see that in Scripture. There's a, a tie over in many of the uh, verses of Scripture. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God's been poured out within our hearts through his Holy Spirit. Interesting. Ephesians 1, 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Take your Bibles and turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, would you? Hebrews 12 is a passage that describes discipline. And it describes a discipline that comes upon those who are loved. He says here in verse 4, You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. It's quite a statement. Hebrews 12, verse 4. So you've been resisting sin, but you haven't resisted it to the point where you've shed blood. He says, You have forgotten, and have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons and this is what he says about sons my son do not regard lightly the discipline of the lord nor faint when you are reproved by him for those whom the lord loves he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives do you see verse six for those whom the lord loves he disciplines one of the aspects of the christian life is discipline from God. That is where God has to bring us back in line. And this is what he says. If you've placed your faith in me, understand we have a relationship. 1 John chapter 3 is going to talk about this. You know, behold what sort of love God has for us that we could be called the sons of God, a, a fact that we are sons of God. As sons now, we understand that there are times of discipline. I don't know about you, but when things happen in life, I believe that we should ask the question, God, are you trying to teach me something? Are you trying to discipline me? I have personally, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but God has personally disciplined me many times in my spiritual life. 
It is a absolute reality. Some of them have been very, very painful. And some of the things I've learned from and some of the things I haven't learned from. I'm a little thick sometimes. I've smashed up cars. I've almost shot myself. I mean, it goes on and on. God has taught me so many times. And, and there are times when it's like, get down on your knees and repent. This is what God does with his children. Uh, if you haven't thought that way, you need to rethink it. Because the one whom God loves, he says he chastens. So when we get offline, God is trying to bring us back in line. It's not that we should say, oh, I guess, you know, bad luck for me. Well, maybe it's more than that. And maybe it's not. Here's the one thing. When Jesus is healing uh, the blind man, the, the disciples want to know, well, you know, who sinned, this man or his parents? And the answer was neither. I want to show you the, the, the glory of God here in this healing. Here's the key point. When we're disciplined, we know it. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit, and we know it. It's always fun in a preacher's house on Saturday night. The weirdest things happen on Saturday night. Uh, so I'm looking at the clock, and uh, I've just watched a, a black and white Western just the last half hour, and it was good. And I was sitting there, and I'm thinking, well, about another hour and a half, you can go to bed, get up to preach, and I'm going through. I have my books right next to me here, and I'm just getting ready. And Karen comes running through the kitchen. We have a big problem. And I am hoping secretly, she's not here, I'm secretly hoping it's not my problem, that we is <laughs> more her problem, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> she says, there is water and it is gushing in the basement. And I've always wanted a, I've always wanted a swimming pool, but <laughs> it's got to be the right circumstances, you know what I mean? So I got down in the corner of the basement, and uh, the first thing you do when there's a water leak in your house, just so everybody knows, is you turn off the water main, right? Yeah. So I reached up, and I turned off the water main. The only problem was this water was not leaking from there. It was actually the water line that comes in from the street. It comes up through my foundation, and this water is coming out of a hose about this big around, and it is three, four feet in the air. And uh, it didn't take me long, and I was completely drenched. And, uh, you know, under normal circumstances, I might have played in it a while, but <laughs> this was a problem. And uh, so I thought to myself, uh, help. And uh, <laughs> so I was calling to Karen to, to make some phone calls because we had to get the water turned off at the street. But as I'm there and I, I, I cut my hands up good, and I, I, I'm trying to, to hold on to this hose <laughs> and redirect the water. And I can remember sitting there and thinking, okay, Lord, are you doing this for a reason? Are you trying to teach me something? Now, God deals with me in my life the same way he deals with you in yours. Now, oftentimes we look at it and say, well, no, I mean, it's, you know, you, I can't think of any sin, but oftentimes I can. And I can see where God is lovingly correcting those whom he loves. And I walk away at the end of the day, and I'm very thankful that my God loves me enough to discipline me. In our society today, you know, and God asks in his word, you know, it doesn't, doesn't every father who loves his son discipline his son? That's a bad question to ask in our society, isn't it? Because most don't. Not, not love their sons, but most don't discipline their sons. But common throughout history has been a loving parent disciplines their child out of love. God does that with us as his children. It's one of the characteristics of love. And it happens because God is holy. And his love and his holiness are linked together. Well, let me give you a few more of these as we kind of move through these quickly. God's love is also sacrificial. And, and we just turn to Jesus Christ and we see, uh, as Jesus said, greater love uh, has no one than this or no man than this, 
then one lay down his life for his friends. Uh, Ephesians chapter five, uh, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Totally sacrificial on the part of almighty God. That is one characteristic of our God's love for us. Uh, God's soar, love is also the source of all human love. Uh, we find that, uh, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. 1 John chapter 4, great passage of Scripture. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, God is love. He is the embodiment of that. And flowing from the embodiment of that love is the love that a Christian should have for his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And then understand that once again, God's love is one attribute among many. And so they come together, just like that blueberry shake, you know, you, all of those ingredients make it wonderful. And this is what God is doing. God is love and he is made up of that which is indescribable. Now, it's at this point that many people don't understand how these things come together. And I'll, I'll share with you just what I mean by that. Oftentimes, people's reasoning, their logic goes something like this. God is a God of love. Would I agree with that? Absolutely. God is all-powerful. Would I agree with that? Absolutely. But the logic goes off the rails when it says God, therefore, cannot allow suffering and pain if he's loving and powerful. And so people look at God and they say, well, God, if you're a God of love, where are you? Why won't you do this? Why won't you do that? And there's a misunderstanding of the other critical elements of who God is. We have to understand God as a whole, don't we? When we come to the New Testament and we think of God's love as it's demonstrated, it's actually going to be demonstrated through Jesus Christ. Remember, we have a holy God. We have a righteous God. We have, because of the holiness and the righteousness, the wrath of God. And just as in the Old Testament where there needed to be that intercessory work, we have Jesus Christ come. And we've answered that question. We've said, why would Jesus Christ come? For God so loved the world. And so because of love, Christ has come on the scene. And now we can have forgiveness through Jesus Christ and pass from death to life. We can come out from under the wrath of God. That is all through Jesus Christ. My friends, Jesus Christ is the demonstration of the love of God. I was reading an article here just recently. It was in uh, my town's newspaper, and it was about a pastor who was retiring. He said in his article, he said, community, he said, is all what this is all about. It's all about community. And he said, community is the greatest demonstration of love. And now I'm prepping for this message and I'm thinking to myself, no, it's not. The greatest demonstration of love is Jesus Christ. Jesus has always been this great demonstration of love. Take your Bibles. We're going to go to a couple passages. 1 John chapter 3 and starting there in verse 1 where John writes, and John loves to use this word agape, but John says, behold what sort of or what manner of love is this. Now, noticing here what he's speaking to, see how great he says a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called the children of God. The manner in which God shows his love is amazing. Dr. David Allen says, words are sometimes like coins. They tend to wear out the more they get circulated. And he says, words are the same way. We toss around the word love, and it's pretty much heard all over in our society. But we've oftentimes lost the meaning of it. In the Greek there are four different Greek words for our one word love. You've heard this probably many times. Three of the Greek words are used in the New Testament. One is eros, it's speaking of physical love. The second is phileto, it's speaking of brotherly love or the type of love you would have for a friend, Philadelphia, phileo. 
eros, physical love, erotic. The third word is agape, and John loves to use it. He's not alone. The New Testament writers all like to use it. In fact, the writers of the New Testament take this word agape and they elevate it to another place. They've given it much more substance and much more meaning. It's the word that's used in Ephesians chapter 5, where it says Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's the word used by John in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. In 1 John 4.8, it states God is agape. Agape is always unselfish in nature. A study of 1 Corinthians 13 would describe for you uh, exactly what we're talking about. We won't take the time to go through that passage this morning, but understand that agape love gives and expects nothing in return. It loves us, and you can use agape love. It's, it's loving someone despite circumstances. It's putting someone's needs above our own. It's doing those things which are sacrificial. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, and it's kind of interesting because when we think of John 3, 16, we think of the gospel of John, for God, God so loved the world uh, that he gave the, his only begotten son, whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. The idea is that John comes, or Jesus comes, John writes, and says that Jesus has come and loved the world and he has died for us. Notice what 1 John 3.16 says. It says, we know, this is how we know love. We know it by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for others. You see, Jesus did for us, which was absolutely amazing. And the question's asked, you know, what sort of love is this? What sort of love would motivate someone? God, how is it that you love us? You see, this type of love is not known on the part of humans. Go back with me to verse 1. See how great a love, or sometimes translated, what sort of love? What kind of love? What kind of love is this? The same word is used where the disciples are on the boat with Jesus and Jesus calms the sea. And they said, what manner of man is this that the wind and the waves obey him? What sort of love is this that's been bestowed on us by God so that we, here's the purpose, so that we can be children of God? What kind of love is this? And the idea is from this passage that this love is so unique. It's so different from the world's love. This is a love that is, is not from around here. Do you know what I mean? It's not from around here. This isn't common in the world. This is unique. It's a, it's a new love. It was something that was beyond the scope of humans before faith in Christ brought us together with God. Now take your Bibles, if you would, and go to Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul wants to explain to the disciples something about the love of God. In Corinthians, Paul has already written and said that the love of Christ constrains me or it controls me. It's what motivated the Apostle Paul. It's what got him to do what he did. Why did Paul get up every morning and serve Jesus Christ? Why did Paul lay aside all the things that he could have had from this world and instead purposefully followed Christ with great passion? It is because, he says, he understood the love of Christ. There was something about the understanding that he had about Christ that motivated him. This is what he says here in Ephesians 3.14. And I've got to back up to this because it's just a long sentence. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. God is the originator of all things. That's his point. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And then verse 17 says, so that. So he's giving us in those first three verses, 
here's the baseline, and here's now what you're needing to do with it, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Understanding how great God is, you would come to a point of faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, and height, and depth of that love. So he says here, what I want you to do is to be able to comprehend. I want you to be able to comprehend this enormous scope of God's love. It's so high, I can't see the top. It's so wide, I can't see how wide it is. It goes so deep, I don't even understand how deep it is. You see, this is, according to 1 John 3, 1, this is a love that's brand new. It's it's a question worth asking. What type of love is this? You may be here today and you may be loved, and and I hope that you are. You are loved by people. You've been loved in the past by people. But friend, listen, you've never been loved like this love. There is only one who can love you like this, and this is Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I want you to be able to comprehend this love. Now, what he uses there is a term that speaks about knowing from the standpoint of an intellectual knowledge. I want you just to be able to see the facts. The facts are you're a sinner and Christ demonstrated his love toward us that while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. He says, I want you to be able to see that because that's a love that is amazing. That's an amazing love. Uh, When we talk about the love of Christ and we talk about all that's entailed there, we're thinking about Jesus who leaves his heavenly throne and comes to a world full of sinners, a place that is hostile, a place that is ready to kill him and hang him on the cross. That's a love that you and I don't wrap our heads around well, do we? How do we possibly understand that? And Paul is saying, I I want you to know that. There have been people who have come to faith in Christ, many, many people, millions, should I say, of people who have come to Christ because they understood what Jesus has done for them. They understood the love of Christ. And that is a wonderful reason for you to come and place your faith in Jesus Christ today. But Paul doesn't stop there. I want you to see the next point. In verse 19, he says, and I want you to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. There's a couple of different words that you can use in the Greek for knowledge. One means to experience something. It's one thing to know it academically, and it's another to experience it. I describe my blueberry milkshake for you, but you've never experienced it. You've never tasted it. You've never, your, your taste buds never went pow, zam, wow, and your, yo, oh, inside your mouth was like rejoicing. You never experienced that. But you say, I kind of know what it's about, Pastor. I'm, ref- I'm very, very much in tune with the taste of vanilla. I understand vanilla ice cream. I understand blueberries, and I understand milk. So academically, you're wrapping your head around it, but you've never experienced it. This is what Paul's saying about this love. He's saying, what I want you to do is not just know this love. I want you to experience this love. And this is what he says, and to know, to experience the love of Christ, which surpasses your knowledge... It goes beyond the scope of of the black and white intellectual understanding. He says that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. When the love of Christ motivated Paul, Paul was on a mission. And this is what you and I need as followers of Jesus Christ. We need to understand the fullness of God. We need to understand, as Paul said, the love of Christ is motivating me. It's controlling me. Problem is, there's a lot of things that are vying for control in our life, isn't there? And the reasons we don't share our faith is because we're not experiencing the fullness of God. We're not as motivated by love. We don't come to church sometimes because that motivation isn't there. We're not really controlled by the love of Christ. Stop and think about where those lines are in our lives. God wants us to see and experience his love in such a way 
that it is driving us. It is why we do what we do. I come to church on Sunday morning because I love Jesus Christ. It is controlling what I do. Paul says, this is the reason why I'm following Christ. This is the reason why I subject myself to, to, to all the difficulties. And he remember, he lists all of the difficulties that he experiences. Oh, I've been shipwrecked, stoned, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, whoa, what a load. And you're sitting there thinking, why would you do that? And Paul would say, because I love Jesus and I understand God's love for me. And God's love for me is motivating me. How much does the love of Christ motivate you, really? If you and I want to attain to this place, to experience the love of Christ that is beyond our ability to intellectually deal with it, it's beyond that, and we want to be full up with the fullness of God, we have to allow ourselves to be controlled by that love. So this love has has a tremendous impact upon our lives. This attribute of God that is one of love is, is pretty amazing, but where it leads the followers of Jesus Christ is equally amazing, isn't it? And what God has always wanted is to have a relationship with his creation whereby he has now demonstrated his love toward us and we love him back. You know, that's what God wanted in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? He just wanted Adam and Eve to tell the serpent to take a hike. We love God better, way more than you. We love God more than our flesh. We just love our God. And God has wanted that relationship with his created beings. And now here you have the opportunity to, A, place your faith in Jesus Christ. Have your sins forgiven, no longer dealing with the wrath of God and the consequences of that wrath. But you have a relationship with Christ. And now as a follower of Christ, you're motivated not by the love of the world, but you're motivated by the love of Christ. You see, too many Christians, we're controlled by the love of this world. That's the problem that we face. We love the world so much it controls us. And we need to love Christ or else we'll never see the fullness of God at work in our life. Let's pray. If you're here this morning and you've yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ, I can't urge you strong enough to make the decision to place your faith in Jesus Christ. God demonstrated love in the person of Jesus Christ. He demonstrated that love to us so that we might have forgiveness of sin and not bear the judgment for that sin. He extends that to the entire world, for God so loved the world. And every single person has the opportunity upon hearing the word of God to place their faith in Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've yet to do that, but maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Kevin, God's really been speaking to my heart about placing my faith in Jesus Christ. I'd love to pray for you today, I really would. If you're here today and you would share that God is at work in your heart regarding placing your faith in Christ, would you just slip up your hand? Everybody's heads bowed, we're not looking around, but God's at work in your heart. Thank you, thank you. You may be here this morning and, and maybe God's spoken to you about loving Jesus Christ. You may be here today and there may be other things you love more. And so the fullness of God is not something that you're experiencing. If God's speaking to your heart today, I just want to encourage you to yield to him. Won't you yield to him? Won't you follow him? Maybe I can pray for you today. I'd be happy to. Just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Kevin, God's at work in my heart. I want to love him more. Thank you. Happy to pray for you. Amen. Let's all just stand and we'll have a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, I thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts and lives. And Father, today I, I lift up those who've asked for prayer. Some, Lord, who've asked for prayer with regard to
personal faith in Jesus Christ. Father, how I pray that you would move them to that point where they would truly express faith in Jesus and him alone. Not trusting in good works, not trusting in the things that can be done here, but Father, alone in Jesus Christ, knowing that Jesus is the only one who can save. Father, truly how blessed we are. And Lord, how I pray that we would love you more. Lord, help us, Father, to be passionate about you. Help us, Father, to look at our life today and to think about what motivates us, what controls us. Father, may we truly be controlled by the love of Christ. May you work in hearts, these who have asked for prayer. Father, I thank you that you're at work in their heart and life. May you continue to, to show them, Lord, exactly what steps you want them to take, that they might bring themselves to the point where they're experiencing the love of Christ in such a way uh, that they understand better who you are and what you're doing in their personal life. So Lord, may we glorify you in submitting our hearts and minds to you today. And may we have a week, Lord, that's just filled with spiritual victory. Father, we may have uh, water breaks and problems and all kinds of uh, difficult circumstances, but Lord, help it never to take away from the love that we have for you. May we love you as you've loved us. Oh, I pray it true in Jesus' name, amen.